Hey everyone, welcome again to another episode of Adscast. Hope you're all well. Um, sorry that I haven't um, done an episode for a little while. Um, I haven't been very well. Um, it's not strep say before anyone says anything, so you don't have to worry about that at all. Um, just a general cold, and you could probably hear it in my voice. I'm just a bit... Nah. Um, but yeah, feeling a little bit better, so I thought I'd come back and do another episode. Um, quite a lot's happened in the World Cup since um, uh, since we last did an episode. Um, this is turning out to be a bit of a World Cup of shocks, to be honest. Uh, we've seen um, Germany and uh, and Belgium both crash out in the group stage. Um, is it massively surprising maybe not i mean belgium definitely are a team of individuals they're not a collective um they're an aging squad uh, i think kevin de bruyne came out and said that anyway that they were too old to win the world cup so it proved they were lethargic there was no tempo their best striker lukaku was injured um nobody wanted to play for each other um bit of a disaster really for them in the end germany um they've been an up and down side sort of in the lead up to the world cup um they've played well at times without being consistent um and you look at the way that they played at the world cup they just did not deserve to go through at all um their lack of a number nine really really hurt them although they had kai havertz who i think ended up with three goals in three games so it kind of begs the question why he didn't get more game time but you know that's for Hansi Flick to uh, to answer. We've seen uh, only in the last few days, um, possibly the biggest shock of the tournament is Spain going out. They've lost to Morocco. Um, we saw at the Euros last year that Spain are a team that just dominates possession. Um, they don't necessarily have the most cutting edge. They they like pass it around and it can be a bit slow, a bit um, I don't want to say lackadaisical, but there's not enough zip at times and they don't have enough players who make runs in behind. Even when they play Morata, um, they just don't have runners from midfield and their wide players don't have a goal threat. Um, with the Costa Rica game aside, where Costa Rica were just terrible, Spain just looked like they struggled to score goals. And so it showed. They had, what, 70% possession against Morocco, barely had any shots on target. Morocco had the better chances. Um, and yeah, they crash out on penalties and Luis Enrique has now lost his job today. The, uh, under 21s coach will replace him. Um, Morocco are now, I think it's the furthest they've ever got in a world cup. Fantastic for them. So we've lost Spain. We've lost Germany. We've lost Belgium and we're only at the quarterfinal stage. Uh, in terms of who's looking best at the world cup, um, we, we we saw Brazil start to turn it on a little bit um, against South Korea. I know a lot of people would be a bit like, oh, it's only South Korea. But this is a team that beat a decent Portugal side in the group. Uh, they're a hardworking side, decent players. They've got Son up front. He's a quality player. And Brazil just smashed them. Um, they They do have players who, when they turn it on, you know, they can play that Samba style that Brazil are synonymous with. But um, they don't do it enough. They do it in patches. But with Vinicius, or Vinicius, as however you want to pronounce it, if Neymar turns up, he's a threat. Um, Casemiro, possibly the best defensive midfielder in the world right now. Um, they've got fullbacks who bomb on. They've got two centre-backs comfortable on the ball. Um, they've got Richarlison, who he's not flamboyant. He just isn't Ronaldo. He's not R9, but he can score goals. Um, he's we, We've seen him score, I think it's three already in the tournament. I mean, the guy's on fire. Um, I'm not convinced by Rafinha. I mean, they've got options with Rodrigo and Anthony. I don't think Paqueta has done that well. He did score a good goal, but they've got options there. They could bring on uh, Bruno from Newcastle. Um, or they could play Rodrigo if they want to play like a 4-3-3. They've got so many options, Brazil. And if they really wanted to turn it on, they could destroy any side in the tournament. That's not to say that they don't have vulnerabilities themselves, but they've looked they've looked pretty sexy when they turn it on. Um, so they're right up there. 
We've seen Argentina slowly get back into the tournament after that shock against Saudi Arabia. Messi is starting to put performances together. He's scoring goals, making goals. They looked all right against Mexico. They looked all right against Poland. Um, it's it's just a case of can they step it up another level? And if teams look to try and mark Messi out the game, do they have players who can step it up and work with him? Because Argentina definitely need Messi to perform if they're going to have a good World Cup. But he needs others to perform as well. So if collectively they can get it together, then Argentina are a threat. That's going to be an amazing game against Holland, by the way. Um, and then we've got England and France. England, I'll talk about them in just a second. France, I mean, they look good. They look fairly solid defensively, although they haven't kept a clean sheet. Uh, midfield, Rabiot's done done well, considering he's sort of he's having to fill a void left by Kante in terms of the defensive ugly uh, side of the game. And of course, they're missing Pogba, that that deep line creative player who can, you know, spread passes and spray the play. He's done very well, Rabiot. Um, there was talk before the World Cup that Manchester United were interested in him. Obviously, they ended up buying Casemiro. Um, but there, of course, there was a lot of negativity about Rabiot. Does he have the pace and intensity? Is he a troublemaker? Is he a disruptive influence? Well, he looks like he's been nothing short of fantastic in this tournament. You know, he's keeping the lights of Camavinga out the side. Um, up front, France have scored a lot of goals, but their goals have only come from three players. Um, Griezmann still doesn't have a goal. That's going to be playing on his mind. Giroud, massive congratulations. He's the outright leading goal scorer in French history. That deserves respect. And Bappe just looks like he's going from strength to strength. Um, if they beat England and obviously get to the semis, um, they're going to take some stopping. And then you're talking about Mbappe possibly being player of the tournament. Um, so to have won it as a teenager... Uh, and then to possibly be player of the tournament before the age of 23. What an incredible start to his career. Um, Fr France look pretty formidable. They're not playing particularly sexy football. They're doing what Deschamps teams do, which is to be tough to beat. They are efficient. They find a way to win. Um, and they've got that element of, of flair up front. Dembele's pace, Mbappe's pace, Giroud, you know, give him a chance, he'll score. Uh so France are a threat, um, and uh, I would I would say them and Brazil probably at the moment are favourites to win the World Cup. You've got teams like England who have been solid, haven't lost a game yet. Uh, can they beat the French? Yes, probably a 50-50 game. And if they do, then England are rightly considered right up there amongst the favourites. Argentina, I mean, they've got such quality but they rely on Messi if Messi's not in the game Argentina struggle like against Saudi Arabia if Messi turns up and is having an effect on the game Argentina could be anyone like they did against Brazil to win the Copa America so they're definitely reliant on him <laughs> Portugal uh, Portugal have got a talisman in Ronaldo and they look much better without him which is kind of ironic um they were functional when he was in the team in the group stage. They were doing enough to get through matches. Uh, they beat Ghana, although they did look susceptible to a bit of pace, which is how Ghana scored. Um, they were more solid against Uruguay. That was the Bruno Fernandes game where he took control, scored a couple of goals. They looked solid. Uh, effectively, it was a dead... Um, it was a dead rubber against um, South Korea. And I think they ended up losing that game. So they've uh, they've definitely um, they, they've they've got the ability to beat anyone on their day with the likes of uh, João Felix and uh, Bernardo Silva. Obviously, if Ronaldo's given a chance, he'll score. But funnily enough, they played against uh, Switzerland and battered them, and. The, the 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 replacements they had for Ronaldo, um, the young guy Ramos, who comes in his fourth cap, I think it was fifth cap, and scores a hat trick. 
But more importantly, him and Rafael Leo, if he comes on, they show dynamism, they show pace and intensity, a willingness to get in behind and run or even press without the ball. All the things that Ronaldo at 37, almost 38, just can't do. And if they continue without Ronaldo, Portugal are a threat. They, certainly based on their performance against Morocco, will be favourites. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Based upon their performance against Switzerland, will be favourites against Morocco. I would fancy them, you know, eight or nine times out of ten to get through this, either in the 90 minutes or in extra time. I think with the options that they've got off the bench, they'll probably win. Then suddenly they're in the semi-finals. Anything can happen there. So you can't disc discount them at all. Um, in regards to England, England have done what I think most people would have expected at the start of the tournament, get to the quarterfinals. It then depends on luck of the draw. Who do you get? Uh, we've seen with France that, I mean, they haven't kept a clean sheet yet. So you can definitely get at them. You can create opportunities. Um, we've seen that their replacements are definitely a second string side. So where England and to a certain extent the likes of Brazil or Portugal or whoever's are blessed, they can bring in replacements. So if you look at Portugal, they looked weak in midfield because they were playing Ruben Neves and uh, Bernardo Silva and Bruno Fernandes. And it was too easy to play through them. Then they replace Ruben Neves for William Carvalho, who's a proper defensive midfielder. And suddenly they've got a bit of bite and tenacity and solidarity and cover for their defence. So Ruben Diaz suddenly looks more comfortable in defence because he's got Carvalho, who he knows is going to sit and protect. Um, Pepe's come in in defence and added a bit of steel and nastiness and experience. Um, and suddenly they look a more solid side. Portugal have got players that can come off the bench who you could make an argument could be in their starting eleven. You know, like I just said, toss up between uh, Carvalho and Neves as to who starts. Then up front, you know, I just said you've got Ronaldo, Rafael Leo, um, Ramos, all fighting to be a number nine. What strength and depth they've got there. England the same. You know, you could make a case for any one of four or five players to start in the two wide berths. Um, Sterling, obviously, we'll have to see if he comes back in time. But, you know, him, Rashford, Foden, Grealish, Saka, any of them could play wide. Um, if you want somebody to whip balls in, you could play Madison as a wide right guy if you needed to, um, just for the ability to get a ball into somebody like Harry Kane. So England have got depth on the wing. Uh, you could even play Trent forward so he doesn't have any uh, defensive responsibilities if you wanted to. And then in, in the middle of the pitch, I mean, any one of Rice, Phillips, um, Henderson and Bellingham as sort of what you'd call like a number six or a number eight. Alongside that, you've got Mount, Foden and Madison, who can be that creative guy, more of a sort of a 10 type player. So England have got strength right through their squad. Players who could come in and could make a, a compelling argument to, to stake a claim for a starting 11 berth. And France don't really have that. We saw against Tunisia that their second string can be got at. It's not anywhere near the same level as their starting 11. And even their starting 11, when they came on four or five changes, whatever it was against Tunisia, if you play with intensity, with and without the ball, and you're brave, running with the ball, one, two, is getting in behind... I mean, Tunisia make, created a lot of chances. Not only did they win the game, they had another goal ruled out for offside. I know that France did as well, but it's not like Tunisia had one chance and took it. They had several opportunities um, to score. And so I think England, who have probably got better finishes up front than Tunisia, if they're brave and if they show more of the Iran game or the Wales game or the second half against Senegal, if they dictate the tempo if they almost press into France's faces don't let France dictate the tempo and set off which is where they came unstuck against the USA where they came unstuck against Senegal if they let France dictate onto them that's where England will struggle but if England press with the ball if England play with an intensity a tempo England can hurt France and if England play like that then I think it's genuinely 50-50 
and you know you're talking about a world cup semi-final at stake so i think england fans would definitely bite your hand off to say quarterfinal no suspensions no injuries we know about ben white and raheem sterling who have had to leave for personal reasons um but against france the reigning champions england definitely on form 50 50 i think england fans would take that and it's going to be an absolutely juicy game um at the weekend um it's it's starting to come to life now the world cup we're starting to see the big teams lay down markers argentina have now played a couple of games back to back where they look more solid more attacking messi looks more like his old self in terms of dictating attacking play and having an effect on the game we're starting to see portugal play less defensively minded more pleasing on the eye and i don't think that's a coincidence that it coincides with ronaldo being dropped we're seeing brazil start to one nil two nil wasn't enough anymore they want to play with a bit of samba they want to bring a bit of enjoyment onto uh, onto people's faces there's still an argument to say that they look better without Neymar. But what a position to be in that they could have Neymar out the team, bring in somebody like Rodrigo or maybe even Bruno. They could play 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1. They've got options. Um, I know that Anthony hasn't set the tournament alight by any stretch, but by cutting inside, I don't think he would do any worse than Rafinha, who I think has been quite disappointing. But we're talking about two great talents for one wide berth there so brazil based on what they did um uh in, in, to south korea um they took their foot off the gas second half they could have knocked them for six or seven um you're, you're looking at them coming into form now um this is this is starting to become a really exciting world cup you could make a case for six or seven we haven't even spoken about holland yet so we could easily make a case for six or seven um you know potential winners here and the semi-final the winner of argentina holland then you've got the winner of portugal morocco you've got um the winner of england and france and the winner of brazil croatia we could be looking at brazil argentina portugal and one of england or france in the semi-final what a strong semi-final lineup that is in terms of quality of team and stature of nations um i mean even if holland got through holland have got history so um i just think it's a um i just think it's a fantastic sort of culmination of the world cup it's starting to get really exciting now i can't wait i'm quite excited as an england fan um i just um as long as England do themselves proud against France, win, lose, or draw, you know, penalty shootout, you could argue, is a lottery anyway, then as long as England play in attacking style and, like I said, do themselves justice, then I don't think we can ask for much more. If Kylian Mbappe scores a wonder goal, you applaud. If England sneak it through 2-1, they're in a World Cup semi-final. Um, and they would have earned it, by the way. Uh then fantastic you know there's no pressure you've achieved your minimum expectation you've beaten the world champions at that stage i i, I just think we, we we don't need to touch on the issues and i've made a conscious effort not to do that during the world cup i wanted the football to do the talking and i think it has done and i think the tournament is getting better the upsets have made it really interesting and um I, I can't wait. I hope everyone um, has been enjoying the World Cup at home. I, I hope that you guys have all been um, glued to your TV sets and have enjoyed all the upsets as much as um, I have. Um, let me know in your comments who you think is going to win. Um, let me know if you've enjoyed the World Cup. Let me know if um, the backdrop has either spoiled the World Cup or you've managed to separate yourself from that. Um, I'll do another episode really soon when we do another recap um, when it comes to uh, the next round of games. I hope everyone in the meantime is very, very well. Um, anyone in the UK who's been affected by um, the Streps outbreak, um, 
you've got my best wishes. I hope anyone who's been affected um, makes a speedy recovery. Um, but until the next time, as I say, stay well, and I'll catch you all very, very, very soon.